Hello, welcome to Cashcrop TV. Thanks for watching another video on history of leaders of thought. Today we will be doing John Locke and Baruch Spinoza. Here it says Benedict Spinoza because uh, Spinoza, sorry, because he ultimately changed his name to the Latinized version of Benedict. And I think this is more telling both in terms of his own story, as we are now foreshadowing, but also in terms of I think it's more important the name one chooses for oneself rather than the one that is given in terms of actually revealing their character. So without further ado, let's begin. So John Locke, they, the two individuals actually are nice in terms of parallels because they were both born in 1632 AD. In the case of John Locke, he was actually born in August. Why do I mention that? Well, I was born in August and it's not an act of narcissism, but I think the more connections you make with any of these lives might make this sort of experience more fruititious. But as well, particularly for me, I think there is a little bit of a, um, perhaps parallels you can see between people who share birth signs and share birth months and even birth years as well. So with that, continue. So he's considered the father of liberalism. So if you're not sure what liberalism is, it's a pretty common term that refers to any sort of um, policy or ideal that puts the individual above perhaps the state or any other sort of means or cause or any other sort of group essentially prior to prioritizes the individual by voltaire he was considered le sage Locke, which is a great title to be given from another really great philosopher enlightenment philosopher he's considered one of the most influential enlightenment thinkers and actually one of the earlier ones of the sort he he followed an, a sort of empiricism sort of belief structure that Francis Bacon had previously established before him, also sharing the same nation, both being English. Further, similarly, he also foreshadowed many of the, the writings and discoveries that Jean-Jacques Rousseau would lay forward in the social contract. He was one of the earlier developers of epistemology and political philosophy, which was still at the time a relatively new field. I would say it only really started to exist around the time of perhaps Machiavelli or Hobbes. And he was known for, as mentioned, influencing both Voltaire and French, the, uh, sorry, Voltaire and Rousseau in France, David Hume and Robbie Burns in Scotland, Kant in Prussia, which is now modern day Germany, and as, as well as the American founding fathers such as Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and um, yeah, pretty much all of them. And also generally Republican ideals and liberalism, where on many occasions he's almost um, directly quoted in many of the famous American historical documents. His theory of the mind played huge impact in terms of I one identifying oneself and identity, which led into Hume and Kant, and he was the first to define self as a continuity of consciousness. He came up with what's called tabula rasa, which is uh, dictates that at one's birth they have a blank slate. That's what tabula rasa means, blank slate. So this pretty much directly uh, countered the predominant Cartesian philosophy in which they believed there was certain um, ingrained or predetermined beliefs and structures within the mind but Locke was believed that there was at birth completely blank slate and thus sense perception only was the way of attaining knowledge or ideas which is purely empiricism he has this quote to kind of reveal this whatever I write as soon as I discover it it not be true my hand shall forwardest throw it, it into the fire so this is almost taking um, rene descartes or the cartesian beliefs to an even further extent so Carte um, uh, rene descartes was always sort of trying to uh, find fundamental truths and the most fundamental truth he came up with was i think therefore i am and john um john locke almost takes this even further by saying that um, even the, the the faculty for thought does not exist at birth and thus everything must be tested repeatedly which leads into empiricism and rigorous testing of that sort introspection is also became important such as observing one's emotions and behaviors and oneself which ultimately led into the field of psychology which was in its infantile stages during Locke's time or perhaps you could even say non-existent and he also 
Um, and yeah, this was long before those such as Freud and Jung. Young. So in terms of, I'm going to structure this a little bit differently. I'm going to go um, sort of back and forth between Locke and Sp Spinoza. So hopefully this uh, reads better than some perhaps some of the other videos. So in terms of Spinoza, he was a Dutch philosopher of Portuguese Sephardi descent, which is actually of Jewish um, Jewish origins. The Sephardis were Jews who lived in Spain and Portugal, but ultimately they had to move to to the um, to the Netherlands due to the to the Spanish Inquisition. He was um, one of the first earliest Enlightenment thinkers, very much in the same light as Locke. I think you could consider Locke and Spinoza together as the two um, founding fathers of the Enlightenment. And uh, yeah, ultimately, he had to settle in Amsterdam due to the the um, well, his his forefathers did. He he's most famous for his biblical and um, or generally um, religious criticism, and he's considered an atheist by many. However, his his thoughts in terms of modern conceptions of the self, like Locke, have had a huge influence on psychology and all um, belief systems that followed both of them. He's considered one of the great rationalists of the 17th century. He was inspired by Descartes and um, as well as John Locke's blank slate. However, it's not known. There's no specific writings or specific dialogues taken between Locke and Spinoza, but it's almost impossible for the two not to have ran into each other considering both of their the influence they ultimately attained and having shared similar geographies during periods. His Portuguese name was Bendito, Bendo de Espinosa, which actually means blessed in Hebrew, which is almost ironic because he is ultimately rejected by the um, Jewish community. He was raised in a particular Portuguese Jewish neighborhood in Amsterdam, so it's I think these are important details in that for him to have came up with such diverse thought, even though he grew up in such a sort of a, um, a mono-thought region is really quite profound. Maybe it was almost that he was so um, pressured by the, uh, the dogmas and common conventional ways of thinking that he went so far to the other extreme. He criticized the Hebrew Bible, its authority and nature of divine, and the Jewish religious authorities ultimately issued what's called harem against him, at the age of a young 23, which actually happens to be my age at this moment, and he was expelled and shunned by the Jew Jewish community and family. So I could only imagine if um, my whole community, my whole family, and all my friends were to um, to shun me at, uh, at this point in my life would be quite difficult. But take into account, it was also very much Spinoza's own doing that resulted in this. Um, Additionally, it was not just the Jewish community that did not support him. The Catholic Church authorities also put his books on the Index of Forbidden Books, and he's widely considered an atheist by almost anyone of any religion. He, Despite this, he lived an outwardly simple life. He worked as an optical lens grinder, sort of in the light of Galileo and Kepler. Probably he was very much inspired by these previous intellectuals, even though it's a different field, both philosophy and astronomy, even though I'm covering both of these in these lives. But I think it's very easy for an, a philosopher to be inspired by an astronomer and vice versa. And as we've seen in many cases, individuals are both. He rejected many honors throughout his life, so he was obviously not... Um, not as ambitious, maybe, as some of the previous lines we've discovered, and he ultimately died at a young age of 44, likely due to lung illness, probably from all the grinding of lenses that he was doing. And he was buried in a Christian churchyard, so not a, a, German, um, a German one, in the Hog. His magnum opus is called Ethica, or The Ethics, and um, we'll, we'll discuss that more in detail. And he's considered the prince of philosophy by Giles Deleuze. He, um, ethics was published posthumously at the year of his death, but 
it's um, had a profound impact on a wide, wide variety of um, fields. He opposed Descartes directly, as mentioned before, in ter- very and very much like Locke in that uh, Descartes believed that there was a dualism of the mind, the body, Spinoza, um, Baruch Spinoza, or Benedict Spruza, Spinoza, believed that they were actually one, or rather identified them quite, really quite differently, and in very much an opposition to Descartes. Um, uh, I guess one quote before moving on back to uh, Jean Locke. The fact is that Spinoza is made a testing point in modern philosophy so that it may really be said you are either a Spinozist or not a philosopher at all by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. So that's also a very, very famous um, intellectual thinker. So another great praise. Um, yeah. So in terms of the actual uh, life of John Locke, so... John Locke, although he also shares a um, same birth month as me, his father was also a an attorney. However, uh, like my father, however, his father was a crown attorney. So from this, you might um, conclude that growing up, he probably grew up in a household that was probably quite partial to the um, to the monarch, and obviously um, not very republican. His father was also a cavalry cra- captain of the parliamentarians um, during the English Civil War. And uh, he carried the exact same name as him. Is also named John Locke. His his parents were followed the religion of Puritans, which is a pretty much Protestants who would um, uh, kind of a more extreme version of Protestants who wanted to pacify the Church of England um, from Catholics. He was born in a small cottage um, in birth, despite his father's relatively great position, and he was baptized in Bristol and well, and born in Bristol as well. Uh, an individual named Alexander Popham, a member of Parliament and his father's commander, sponsored his studies at the prestigious Westminster School, and at the age of twenty, he went to Christ Church, Oxford, um, to study to further his studies. He preferred the modern philosophers like Descartes to the classical ones, and but uh, despite his certain predispositions, he was actually a very, very strong student. Um, in terms of that, um, I think, personally, I, I, I think I, I do love the classics. As you've seen, I've covered many of the classics in terms of lives. Is the, uh, are the classics better than the moderns, or are the moderns better than the classics? I think that's an unfair question. It probably depends on a case by case, so I'm surprised that Locke would um, turn, a, turn his head away from the classics. He received his bachelor's degree in 1656 and his master's degree in 1658. He received a bachelor's in medicine in 1675, studying under Richard Lower, who is um, quite famous, and Robert Boyle, Thomas Willis, and most importantly, he later um, ends up working with Lord Ashley, who we'll discuss in more detail but he starts working with lord ashley because lord ashley was having a issues with his liver and lord ashley becomes uh, a very powerful person in the nation and obviously and evidently yields many great opportunities for Locke. and obviously this medical career as the uh, glass grinding paid the bills for spinoza the medical career largely paid Locke's bills uh, so an individual named Thomas Citizen Sydenham taught him medicine, and he was inspired by an essay concerning, and this led to a lot of uh, his philosophies regarding in his essay concerning human understanding, and later led to his blank slate theory, which he would later publish in 1689. So I suppose maybe by studying the human body and perhaps studying, uh, the, studying the brain wasn't really a field at the time, but perhaps seeing that perhaps diseases can be cured and um, uh, muscles can be built and the body can be changed. I, I, I could see how the tabula rasa or the blank slate uh, philosophy or belief could be a natural um, progression from these studies. So eventually he becomes working for Lord Ashley, who lived in Exeter House in London, and he so he had board with Lord Ashley. 
and he Lord actually attributed him for saving his life because he had a uh, liver issues. Um, this leads me to think maybe Lord Ashley was an alcoholic, which wouldn't have been too uncommon for um, parliamentarians at the time. He was actually was famous for being the founder of the Whig movement, and he became Lord Chancellor and ultimately First Earl of Shaftesbury. So I'll, I'll, he's also referred to as Lord Shaftesbury, if you've seen that name. But he ultimately falls out of favor in 1675. He left to, uh, following this, Locke went on to tutor um, in France for a time, once again, medicine, probably because the uh, his mentor, Ashley, was uh, no longer had great political uh, influence in the country, so he thought it would be a good opportunity to travel and perhaps raise some funds. Particularly, I think at this point, he started to become more of a Republican because that's something that the Whigs supported. Uh, here's an image representing the Republicanism, which is pretty much anti-monarchy. So probably he left to France to maybe either appease his own beliefs or to avoid um, per potentially persecution. He also served for a time as secretary to the Board of Trade, and he, and during this time he composed two treaties on government, or most of it at least, and. Um, much of his writings were actually promoted as well. His political writings were promoted by Shaftesbury. So once again, um, sort of Shaftesbury's Republican ideals sort of dripping into Locke's and, and his writings. And he, this is where he starts to really believe in political legitimacy over absolute monarchy. And these are ideas that um, obviously we... I think are easily acceptable, particularly if you live in a republic such as the United States or Canada. Um, maybe a little bit more difficult to believe if you be live in a country with a monarch such as the United Kingdom, even though they are highly restricted at this point. However, at this time, one of the leading past intellectuals was Thomas Hobbes, who clearly advocated for the uh, having a monarch and an, an absolute monarch. So these, this would have been going against the, the grain of conventional philosophy at the time. Uh, with this, he later flees to the Netherlands, and he lives in Rye House Plot in uh, 1683. Um, w sorry, he fled to the Netherlands because he was convicted of potentially working on the Rye House Plot in 1683, which was an uh, initiative to assassinate Charles II. It's le unlikely that Locke had probably anything to do with this assassination attempt while back in the back in the United Kingdom, but. Perhaps just his mere presence and association with Ashley and the Whig movement might have made him a suspect. It said uh, at this point, while he was in the Netherlands, it would have been impossible for him to have been unaware of Spinoza. Um, they would have agreed on many things, particularly those relating to um, education and blank slate, and also for religious tolerance. But perhaps they might have disagreed on some of the... Um, certain ethics and metaphysical and non-empirical notions. But they definitely would have agreed that the church and state should be separated, and they both agreed clearly in religious toleration. After the Glorious Revolution, um, he returned to the United Kingdom, and things started to settle down. He published an uh, essay concerning human standing, which he uh, at this point, where he clearly outlines the blank slate um, philosophy, and two treaties on civil government, where he advocates for the uh, abolition of absolute monarchy, and then later uh, he publishes a letter concerning toleration, which advocates for religious toleration and li a little bit of the fear of Catholicism in the United Kingdom. So, li religious toleration with um, perhaps a little bit of... Uh, anti-authority in that, but something that would have clearly aligned with Spinoza's beliefs. He never married, never had any children, and he suffered asthma attacks throughout his life. Later, he went to live in Essex with Lady Masham, who was also a philosopher. Um, he was considered a champion of the Whigs, and he associated with John Dryden and Isaac Newton in the latter parts of his life, and ultimately he died in 1704 in a in village of High Laver in Essex, he was he managed to live through the Great Plague of London, the English Restoration, the Great Fire of London, and the Rye House Plot. 
which he was considered um, uh, perhaps a suspect of. So nonetheless, he lived a very exciting life despite not having much of a family. In terms of the life of, we'll get back to his actual philosophies after we discuss the life of Spinoza. But um, so Spinoza was, as mentioned before, a Sephardic Jew, which was a Jew living formerly living in Portugal and Spain, who left during the Portuguese Inquisition in 1536 and fled to Amsterdam. His father, Miguel, was a merchant and warden of the synagogue, so uh, probably a pretty strong religious influence in his life, which ultimately, once again, alludes to the the, um, significance of his differing beliefs. He... um, His father buried his three wives and six of his children um, died before adulthood, so... Uh, despite being a religious and pretty powerful figure, figure he probably had a lot of uh, pretty melancholic life that probably passed on to Spinoza. Another thing to note here, actually, um, I also put down the birth month of November here. This is not my birth month, but this is actually the birth month of my brother. So um, just by reading these, I was looking for parallels between my brother and Spinoza and myself and Locke. Just um, kind of nice ways to sort of increase your um, connectedness to the content you're you're studying or the people you're studying um in amsterdam he also lived for a time in amsterdam most of his life in amsterdam and rotterdam and he kind of just moved between the two cities mostly the uh, netherlands at the time was a cosmopolitan and commercial hub so um it was probably the most um uh, most, I would, yeah, I, I suppose you could use the term liberal. It was the most liberal, but also most forward thinking region in Europe at the time. So I actually, despite his family and despite his community, it's still a somewhat, um, uh, uh, fruitful environment to establish his ideas. He was the second son, but as mentioned, um, many of his other siblings died his Portuguese was his mother tongue, but he also probably, well, surely spoke Hebrew, Spanish, and Dutch, and probably a bit of French and Latin later. So uh, we could call him a lango, uh, um, uh, a lango glot, or um, oh, okay. a, a person who speaks many languages. Um, he was had a traditional Jewish upbringing. He attended Ye- Yeshim which is text studies in the Talmud and Torah. And he was considered a star student actually at the time and that he was even on track to potentially become a rabbi, but he never graduated. Um, the, his, the first son of his father died at 17. So this must have had a sort of impact on his own personal life. And he was assigned to follow in his father's business. Francis Van den Eden tutored him until the age of 20, who was a former Jesuit. So this might have probably led into some of his religious toleration, but he was also a radical Democrat. So this probably sort of got the, um, sort of the the radicalism that is evident in Spinoza's nature. uh, Additionally, Francis Vaughn, Van de Eden also in- introduced him to modern philosophy, particularly Descartes, Descartes who is the most, probably the most uh, prominent uh, thinker or ha- possessed the most prominent ideas at the time. And um, yeah, his father died at the age of 20, so three years later, and he did all the, the, the conventional Jewish duties. He recited Kaddish duly and did his 11 months of, of mourning. So I think maybe this tells you the two things either a he was not so um strict to his own beliefs that he would not mourn his own father or b this means that at this point only this point in life he did not believe in his ideas this much uh his thought regarding his will he actually had a had a um uh, contest was contested with his sister so he actually fought his court his sister in court for uh, this will dispute, and he even won. But after this, he sort of repented and gave it back to his sister. So I think this is kind of um, this anecdote specifically 
uh, details Spinoza's character in that he comes across he comes across very strong at the outset, and some of his words, particularly in regards to religion, could be very damning. But ultimately, he does believe in a certain god in himself, and he is um, a softer as he sort of de- uh, details more. At this point, he changed his name to Latin Benedictus or Benedict de Spinoza, which is probably. Um, once again, moving away from his Jewish origins, but more towards uh, even uh, the Christ- Christianity. One of the questions was, why did Spinoza never switch to Christianity? I think for the same reasons that he rejected uh, Judaism. So I don't think he was specifically against Judaism. He was against religions, um, conventional religions, uh, objectively. He boarded with Francis Van de Eden, his teacher at the time, and even taught at his school. He fell in love with this girl named Clara Van den Eden, who was the daughter, but supposedly um, she, well, firstly, she was only 13, but she went on to marry a richer man. So kind of a uh, a love a tragedy might have been amplified through history, but either way, once again, another uh, melancholic event for Spinoza. He associated with the collegiates, who were rational remonstrants. Uh, who met at colleges to practice religious tolerance and other dissident Christian groups. So uh, Spinoza was um, well aware of the the modern religious social circles in his community and in Europe. But once again, he did not convert. He never switched to Christianity. He also found reasons to reject that too. His uh, rejection of Judaism, though, is considered a lengthy internal struggle. He has this quote. um, uh, All things in nature proceed from certain definite necessity and with utmost perfection. Nothing happens by chance with this world. So he does believe in a certain God, but he does not believe that they, uh, they lead by providence or they actually affect the um, the world or respond to events in the world. Um, later, though, he gets more aggressive and he says, um, God has a body and nothing in, in, um, in two members of scripture says otherwise. So basically he says that uh, God is too perfect and should not have a body. And this is kind of like we've seen paralleled before, like um, uh, the joke is if if the horses were to make a god it would look like a horse and so how do we know it looks like a human is the logic there eventually he's considered a heretic by the synagogue and they um, at one point they rip his cloak and he continues to wear his ripped cloak in spite of them for for years after this so it's kind of evident that although the religious authorities might have been harsh on him he was also equally as uh, boisterous on his end and provocative. He starts to fall into financial distress, these, um, but fortunately his younger brother Gabriel manages the importing business for him. So as the, the eldest living brother, Spinoza sort of gets off easy with his inheritance. His younger brother runs the business and he sort of gets to work on his religious and uh, philosophical ideas. Um, he goes to the the first anglo war hurts the dutch economy quite uh quite clearly so he once again runs into further financial distress his he tries to swap his mother's estate out for his father's estate which had his mother's estate had no debts but um but once again this doesn't occur it's prevented but his brother seems to bail him out um, and from at this point as well, due to his financial failures, his his donations to the synagogue also dropped to zero. And I think this could be seen as a sort of a uh, metaphoric like event for his um, respect for the religion, or a parallel. Or, uh, at, so at twenty three years old, he is expulsed. Uh, receives expulsion from the synagogue, and um, it's actually the most harsh and damning letter that they ever give or has ever been recorded so they took a really really tough stance on um, him 
he fights it for a time and reject and uh, and sticks to his beliefs. But either way, they um, pretty much give him the most damning sentence they ever give to a former um, member of the synagogue. Despite this, and despite being rejected by his church and community, he lived a, a priestly life up until his end. He, um, as mentioned, never converted to Christianity. However, the only criticism, he never did anything weird, he never had any children. Occasionally, the only criticism was that he played with spiders. But once again, I think that could be seen as, once again, maybe his his agnostic love for humanity. He he uh, communicated with Leibniz, which I think is a very important um, uh, note to, uh, of contention in that he was a very strong believer of determinism and Leibniz um, was probably the, is, is probably the most famous name in terms of determinism, who was ultimately countered by Voltaire in his short novel Candide, in Voltaire's short novel Candide, which I recommend reading, a great place to start in terms of philosophy. He, and he worked quite a bit with the Hugens on lenses and telescopes, as mentioned before, as a lens grinder. And then he died at a young age of 44. Um, with this, he managed to produce his short treatise on God and many and his well-being. And yeah, so in terms of the actual, so that is his life. And once again, he probably died from uh, 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 grinding the glass, kind of parallels the asthma that Locke had been suffering. So in terms of Locke's ideas, so firstly, in terms of two treaties, um, these were those that he advocated for republicanism and anti-absolute monarchy. However, during the late 17th century and early 18th century, they were rarely read or cited, except occasionally amongst more, um, I guess you could call them radical rigs, um, but otherwise they were pretty unpopular. In Oxford, even in Oxford in 1695, they were considered just a, a great noise, but never really reached much success outside of the university. Algernon Sidney's discourses concerning government was obviously much more popular in terms of uh, promoting ra uh, Republican ideals. It said that it was so me rarely mentioned in the Glorious Revolution um, by that even Whigs not ready for notional were not ready for the notional and abstract content. So I think maybe it was just because it maybe took a too tough stance on um, anti-absolute monarchy, or perhaps his affiliation with um, Ashley made him too politically motivated for um, making such writings, or maybe the world just wasn't ready for it. It's hard to it's hard to uh, determine. Later, 50 years after Queen Anne's death, there was only one, within the 50 years after Queen Anne's death, there was only one reprinting, and in 1773, it repicked up Transaction, uh, the first American reprinting in Boston, and uh, ultimately um, got much more success in the rise of American taxation and the rise of American republicanism. So, yeah. He also considered the one who launched li liberalism by Michael Zuckart. This yellow flag is representative of liberalism. Um, he also is known for tampering hamp ha Hobbesian absolutism. So Hobbes believed in absolute monarchies were necessary in terms of curbing the infinite um, greed of humans. But he thought that this were too extreme. And he clearly advocated for the separation of church and state, which is something Spinoza would have um, been partial to as well. Voltaire referred to him as the sage Locke. He wrote that um, the the uh, Je Jefferson has this quote: "Bacon, Locke, and Newton. I consider them the three greatest men that ever lived." And uh, this quote: "Everyone has a natural right to defend his life, liberty." Uh, life, health, liberty, or possessions has been reworded to um, uh, uh, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is obviously a very important American ideal and evidences the influence on the American um, uh, philosophy and constitution. In the Declaration of Independence in the se uh, Second Treaty, it, it mentions a long train of abuses, which is almost verbatim, quotes John Locke. 
he's his but even beyond this beyond his uh, advocation for um curbing the powers of a monarch his influence on epistemology is arguably even larger so he redefined subjectivity and self historians charles taylor and gerald siegel say an essay in um an essay concerning human understanding in 1690 marked the beginning of modern Western conception of self. So I think of Locke in, in terms of epistemology as the next natural progression after Rene Descartes. It, his theory of association influenced the, um, the subject matter of modern psychology. At the time, empiricists um, thought there were two types of ideas, the complex and the simple. However, Locke thought that um, these two interact through association. And this ultimately inspired David Hume and George Berkeley to expand theories to explain how humans gain knowledge in the physical world and ultimately um, all facets of, of psychology, but just the, the just generally the whole education industry, which also Spinoza had a large influence on. In terms of his theories of religious toleration, he wrote the letter concerning toleration in 1689, or ultimately published in 1692, which he wrote in the aftermath of the European wars of religion in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. Uh, particularly, I guess, the religious wars started following the Protestant Reformation in 1517. The arguments are as follows. Firstly, earthly judges, the state in particular, cannot dependently evaluate the truth claims of competing religious standpoints so for so i think that's given the firstly the 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 governments can only ever approach the actual intentions of religion um sometimes it might be perfect but there will always be flaws and next part two even if they could enforce a single true religion a single true religion would not have the desired effect because belief cannot be compelled by violence. So even if the governments could read the religions properly, um, it it uh, it could not be enforced by violence because that would ultimately be detrimental. And thirdly, coercing religious uniformity would lead to more social disorder than allowing diversity. And then lastly, um, even if they did choose one religion, uh, forcing one religion upon them would cause more um, division than they than the objective of unification. Uh, this ultimately inspired Martin Luther, um, and uh, well, sorry, this was inspired by Martin Luther um, during the Protestant Reformation and Baptist theologians such as John Sawyer and Thomas Haley's, as well as Roger Williams, a famous Baptist theologian and the founder of the Rhode Island colony. He um, advocated the mother country adopt religious freedom. So um, obviously, once again, yielding religious freedom in the United States, his influence is evident there as well. Some say he could be considered a little bit hypocritical with respect to liberalism, as he was uh, a major investor in the Royal African Company which was an English slave trade. So if he was such a liberal, if he really did believe in individual uh, liberties, um, then how come he advocated and supported and invested in the slave trade? He also helped in the establishment of the feudal aristocracy and absolute power over slaves in the United States, um, which is um, obviously shows a little bit of hypocrisy in terms of his ideals. In terms of Besides epistemology, besides psychology, besides um, govern governance, he also had uh, many a theory of value and property. So property, in a broad sense, represented human interests and aspirations. Narrowly, it could be defined as material goods, um, natural, uh, which material goods could be naturally um, earned through labor at least where there is enough land and land and is good left in common to others so he thought it was it is fair for individuals to accumulate additional capital if they invest their own labor this could be seen in chapter five of the second treaties however there is a limitation so he is not um, like many of the other philosophers who always take their their ideas to the extreme he thought that um 
too much good, uh, too much wealth should be restricted. Which th this could be considered the labor theory of value and property. Uh, ultimately, he, this led into the um, the creation of what we now have as microeconomics, where he came up with sort of one of the first concepts of supply and demand, which can be evidenced here. The price of any commodity rises or falls by the proportion of numbers of buyers and sellers. So very evident here. Um, he thought that governments cannot dispose of the estates of subjects, um, which is... Um, governments cannot dispose of these states and subjects, which is obviously p foreshadowing the ultimate uh, coming of communism and Karl Marx. Um, Marx actually specifically critiques this in saying that um, in some cases, governments should and do have the right to dispose of states and subjects arbitrarily. So that's for you to decide, do you believe in Locke here or do you believe in Karl Marx? He, um, lastly, in terms of, I suppose we could call this uh, uh, finance, um, gold and silver may be used as money as they may be hoarded up without injury to anyone. So specifically gold and silver he thought were good forms of currency because unlike, for example, if we use bread as currency, um, if someone hoards up too much, it could lead to starvation, it could lead to, um, and they're also perishable, but gold and silver are, are non-perishable and it's to no one's detriment if, like, it's not like we feed off gold to hoard it up. So, and I think this could also, um, one could derive a good argument from Locke in terms of the cryptocurrency um, debate, which is quite popular right now. In terms of political theory, he's considered the founder of social contract theory, so not the one who wrote the book Social Contract Theory, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who came later. It's considered John Locke who came up with social contract theory. But... Unlike Thomas Hobbes, he thought that human nature char is characterized by reason and tolerance. So Thomas Hobbes thought that human nature was um, characterized by um, brutishness and um, violence. But he did uh, did concede to Hobbes a little bit in that the, um, the human nature is does have room for selfishness, and this could be evident with the introduction of money, as he discussed. He thought in a natural state all people were equal and independent and had the right to defend their life, health, liberty, and professions. And this ultimately inspired life, liberty, and happiness in the American um, Declaration of Independence. Um, he thought, like Hobbes, they had these natural right, but in a civil society, it's um, uh, some oftentimes these rights need to be restricted. And that's what, what I think separates Locke apart from pretty much all other philosophies, philosophers is that he never takes any of his arguments really to an extreme. He always advocates for something in the middle. And um, where Hobbes advocates for absolute monarchy, um, Locke says, okay, a monarchy is fine, but let's do something in between. And with this hypocrisy, maybe that leads to him something, uh, something of an individual who's rather indecisive. Um, back to on price theories on some considerations of the, converse, uh, of the consequences of lowering interest and rising of value of money, which he wrote in 1691. Um, he, he further expands on this, uh, uh, this relationship between the number of buyers and sellers and saying that um, supply is the quantity and demand can be defined as rent. So this was the first sort of, um, or the first that I'm aware of, uh, introduction of, of supply and demand relationship in economics. And uh, I think he um, referenced Ecclesiastes here in Money Answers All Things. This ultimately is an early theory on capitalism, and this would lead into later uh, John Adams. Lastly, he thinks that um, everything had uh, a, the value of a product could be considered based on its earning capacities of land. So this is like a income approach, an income approach, and now we still use this in finance. Um, like an income approach would be like a, a DCF, for example, um, which actually uses cash flow. But either way, you can value you can value something probably on well you can on on threefold. It's intrinsic value, like its ability to generate cash flows. It's relative value, and um, and its asset value, 
what is it actually made of the actual good um yeah he thought that nations need to seek a favorable balance of trade um if they fall behind they'll uh well fall behind economically but and they also need to avoid getting ripped off he thought that world money stock needs to grow um, on its own to keep up with the the global growth of money stock he thought that exchange rates theories and commodity movements were similar um, let less volatile than commodities he thought export balance and large money stock were um, uh, led to a company's exchange to rising above par which had been proven to be true relationships but not necessarily the direct cause there are many there are many causes and it's still considered a chaos system so none of these things are true but there obviously is a relationship between export balances and uh, a currency um, value or exchange rate he thought that middlemen such as brokers were um, resulted in enlarging the mo monetary circuit and eat into the profits of laborers and landholders so therefore the more brokers the more middlemen the less efficient the overall system which was negative for personal and public economy so i guess what he's most fam famous for um, is his concept of the self that conscious thinking thing um, he considers it um, in his essay concerning human understanding, which he produced in 1690, he he discusses argues against the non-empty state, which is, for example, the two predominant uh, advocates for a non-empty state would be the Augustinian argument, which is original sin. So, for example, Augustus of Hippo thought that um, humans are born with a certain duty to. Re um, Adam and Eve's original sin so that would be obviously not a blank slate we are born with a mission so that is something that Locke disagreed with but also the Cartesian that we have these ingrained beliefs and thought processes so two uh, very very um, uh, Cartes believed men innately believed in basic logic so two very great thinkers that Locke thought it was his duty to go up against he thought that the tabula rasa could be filled with either sensations or reflections. Later, he wrote this book called Some Thoughts Concerning Education in 1695, where he approaches education with, uh, with respect to the tabula rasa, in that the, the student's mind is an empty cabinet, and um, he has this quote, I, th I think I may say that of all the men we meet with, Nine parts of ten are what they are, good or evil, useful or not, by their education. In fact, he probably, he actually believes ten out of ten, but I think it's, it, what he means is that the, the remaining, uh, the remaining ten percent, or one in ten, can, like, is not in control of the education, but not that it is something that's innate. He thought youngness was, uh, a foolish mind, one that is not full. Um, and he thought to teach of goblins and spirits was to fill the mind with useless things. These are all things that, he, that I think we still see in the education system. We don't discuss um, goblins and spirits in our modern day education systems. Um, and ultimately this led into the discovery of psychology and David Hartley's observation of man in 1749, which... Uh, laid out the biological mechanisms for association and how learning processes are actually created. He thought that, uh, so Descartes believed that one could actually achieve real pain in a dream, because I think therefore I am, but he argued against this once again, arguing against Descartes. He said that no physical pain was possible in a dream. Um, it was merely an illusion. Lastly, in terms of religion, he thought, um, uh, obviously believed in religious tolerate, toleration, but definitely he was not an atheist, um, and he thought that atheism would ultimately lead to chaos. 
he wrote what's called the reasonableness of Christianity as delivered in scriptures in 1651, defending this position. And um, he, uh, he has pious and gratitude in that God gave reason to man and created man equal and relates monarchy to Adam ruling Eve. Um, and he thought that uh, uh, in Genesis, in that um, Adam was appointed by God to rule over Eve and he revealed that as an argument for monarchy. So, once again, um, showing a lot of hypocrisy on Locke's part, he was very pro-republicanism, but he thought that um, the scripture um, justified absolute monarchy. And also, the beliefs he had regarding equality were also very much uh, countered by his actions in the United States and with relation to the slave trade. Lastly, in terms of the philosophy of Benedict Spinoza. So, his beliefs can be divided into what's called substance attributes and modes. He thought the, these are the fundamental concepts with which Spinoza sets forth a vision of being illuminated by his awareness of God. They may seem strange at first sight to question what is, he replies, substances, its attributes, and modes. Uh, this is not Hegel, but um, yeah. that's Carl Jaspers uh, to confirm. He thought that despite his um, his rejection from the Jewish community and pretty much all religious authorities, he did believe God exists, and it is, but it is abstract and impersonal. He's considered a classical pantheist by Charles Hartshorn uh, and a, a Puritan materialist. Uh, in that he opposed to, he was opposed to mind-body dualism of Descartes. So Descartes believed that the mind and body were separate, but he was a uh, he believed that we are all made of a certain material, but the mind and the body are, are ultimately um, two separate attributes. He thought that everything was made of atoms and probabilistic paths. Uh, paths um, which are the only fundamental substances. So there is no aether, there is no um, soul. This ultimately led into the beliefs that we see in quantum mechanics, in that everything is made up of certain molecules and their random paths, which ultimately yield reality as we see it. Um, he di this differs slightly from strict determinism in that he believed in a probabilistic world. Um, the Stoics believed in a strict determinism. He thought order and unity in radical thought thus were uh, were determined. So any sort of radical thought was almost inevitable by the chaos system that we live in. And these this was used as a weapon against um, received authority. Um, he believed that everything exists in nature, the universe. Nature also, he thought, was synonymous with God. So God is nature. And there is only one reality and one substance and one set of rules governing nature and reality. Therefore, God equals nature. And there are essentially just two names for the same reality. So to kind of, uh, I guess, visualize this, um, there's the basis of the universe, which is the substance, which stands... Um, beneath matter, I guess it's the smallest divisible part. But within the substance, there are two lesser entities which can be defined as modes and modifications, which are certain ways of expressing itself. And God or nature applies these modes and modifications to the substance. So this is our substance, its attributes, and its modes. Um, this was explained in Ethics, his magnum opus, uh, posthumously. Therefore, he thought that free will was non-existent and just the result of awareness of sensations. He has this quote, men are conscious of their desires and unaware of the causes by which their desires are determined. So he thought free will was merely just a, a, a false conception because um, the um, it, it, it is derived from a certain cause anyways. This can be considered deus deus. Sive natura, God in nature. 
He thought that God had infinite attributes and thought and, ex and extension in terms of size. So therefore, uh, mind and body are simply two of these infinite attributes. Therefore, physical and mental worlds are intertwined and casually related um, with respect to the substance. Therefore, this was considered a solution to the mind-body problem or natural monism in that the, universal, the universe separates mind and body um, only in that they are different, but um, they're um, different in appearance, but fundamentally the same. So I guess um, there are two aspects, but just because one is physical and one is non-physical does not mean they are not um, not parallels. I think it could could be considered uh, maybe analogous to matter and antimatter in that antimatter is not even nothing. It's not even an opposite, but they are um, objectively parallel, if that's, uh, that explains it better. Once again, God does not rule by providence, um, and it merely rules by a deterministic system. So, providence, he does not respond to the actions in the world. He says, uh, things could not have been produced by God in any other way or in any order, any other order than this case. So he thinks that, once again, everything is determined and inevitable and by nature or God, as they are the same. Uh, therefore, he directly trans challenges the transcendental God that actively responds to events in the universe, and he thought that everything is a long chain of, chain of cause and effect, metaphysically, which metaphysically humans have no control over. This obviously leads into Leibniz's argument and is later countered by Voltaire. Therefore, do see a natural God uh, in nature is unaffectable because it is infinity. And he thought oh, there can only be one infinity. It is foolish, he considered, to have multiple infinities. And infinity cannot be affected. So um, this is very much like our earlier monoists who also believed that infinity was uh, essentially God or the source of everything. Back to determinism, he thought that actions were driven by necessity. And with further adequate understanding of emotions and affections, one can better act upon the, this necessity. But there is still no free will. Um, he thought that one who increases their activity versus passivity would be more free but and therefore more close to God in terms of serving this inevitable plan. So it's either you act or don't act um, and contribute to... Uh, nature, but it's still not free will. Um, he and he quotes this by saying, "Man, humans dream with their eyes open, or men are conscious of their desires and unaware by which they are determined." As I mentioned, um, in terms of Stoicism, he's considered uh, very much his ideas were in line with Stoicism, and they were similar in that they hoped to provide people with a ways of achieving happiness. So unlike some of our previous philosophers where they were maybe descriptive but not instructive, he was instructive and actually wanted people to have better lives, but he rejected that reason could um, control emotions, which was a key aspect of stoicism. Uh, all, the only way an emotion could be controlled is through a stronger emotion. He believed that also there were two types of emotions. There are active emotions, which are ones that are rationally understood, and passive emotions, which are incomprehensible and not understood. And only through knowledge may one convert between a passive emotion to an active emotion. And this is key to understanding Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, where one takes a passive emotion and turns it into an active one and learns how to better act upon their life. Such as, for example, um, maybe a, a hidden memory, one needs to actively convert it into a passive uh, belief system through psychoanalysis. In terms of his ethical philosophy, he thought that ethical beliefs match the Epicureans, and they were renounced beyond the material world, but they differed from the Epicureans in that they focused, uh, Epicureans focused more on curbing physical pleasure, whereas Spinoza believed that, um, 
they needed to focus on their emotional well-being, which is more like Stoics. At the start of the treatise on emotional understanding, he outlined what he held to be uh, true and final good, which is good and evil are relative concepts. Um, so nothing is intrinsically good and nothing is intrinsically evil. So classically, things that are considered classically good or evil, such as um, murder or charity, um, were only good or evil for humans, not necessarily nature. Therefore, in a deterministic world, all things proceed from a certain definite necessity and with the utmost perfection. Um, there is no chance and no contingency. Uh, contingency was a common topic discussed by Pla Plato, Aristotle, and most recently, and most relevantly, Thomas Aquinas. So therefore, a world is guided by, guided by necessity, which is, uh, and therefore good and evil are sort of just, um, uh, uh, I guess, human constructs that we apply to this huge chain of events. Um, the world only looks imperfect from our limited perception, but he believes that with a broader scope, the the world will reveal itself as perfect. Lastly, in terms of knowledge, he thought that experiences, uh, there are three types of knowledge. There are experiences, knowledge related to experiences, which is considered the passive mind, which could be mutilated, confused, and without order. Um, there's the reasoning uh, and emotions knowledge, which is considered pagan virtue, which is the ones related to Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, anything that is classified as imperfect virtue. And the third type of knowledge is law, knowledge of God, which requires reason and rationality from the mind and is the essence of God and the individual from adequate causes. Perfect virtue, which... Um, so, essentially, one can can achieve the, or sorry each of these types of knowledge are associated with uh three i guess uh, approaches so experiences come about from opinion uh reasoning and emotions come about from a reason but the uh, knowledge of god and knowledge of nature comes from about from intuition so he thinks that true blessedness could be inspired um and and um, and created through intuition, but ultimately um, this led to the field of psychology in terms of uh, revealing this type of knowledge and converting uh, passive thoughts into active thoughts. So, so yeah, that's Spinoza. So, um, although probably most known for his rejection by the religious authorities, he was very much just as much of a, a philosopher and epistemologist as John Locke. So, in terms of the comparison, in terms of, uh, in terms of simil similarities, they were both born in the same year, as mentioned um, previously. They both had a um, pretty good education and grew from about similar class standings, upper middle class. Um, I think Spinoza had the more difficult life growing up, whereas Locke was gifted with... Um, was pretty much uh, accepted by the powerful figures with open arms. Spinoza managed to make himself uh, be cast aside. They are both rather instructive in terms of trying to help people improve their lives, whereas many other previous philosophers were a little bit more descriptive. Um, I think uh, they might differ in that um or once again they sim they are similar and they both share the beliefs of religious toleration but i think they're different in that Locke might be seen as a little bit more um uh i guess faltering in that he was a bit more agnostic in terms of his belief he did not believe in absolute monarchy but he did not believe in um absolute democracy he did not believe in absolute capitalism he did not believe in absolute communism he always kind of advocated for something in between whereas in spinoza he almost always advocated for something of the extreme it's not that some things are contingently good or contingently evil things are never good things are never evil so spinoza could see 
be considered a bit more of an extreme. So, with the last, uh, I guess, broad stroke of comparison, I would say Locke could be considered more of a uh, one who is trying to create light and try to discover things, where Spinoza is one who is kind of more trying to uh, turn off lights and sort of uh, refute points. So, yeah, that is the life of Locke and Spinoza. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you might watch some of the ones I will make in the future. Thanks so much.